Islamist groups um, were actually approached political activism with a very egalitarian understanding of, um, of Islam. And there wasn't also, as prior to 9-11, there, there were anti-Muslim attitudes prior to 1991, uh, but for the most part, um, there wasn't many obstacles that they, they faced. Another thing uh, and it was that they were coming, Muslim, American Muslims were coming in more, they were wealthier, they were more educated, they had more resources. Uh, African-American Muslims, that's a prominent indigenous community were here uh, that could also help people navigate and become, uh, you know, be able to argue that they are American. Um, so the adoption of an American identity wasn't as problematic for a lot of younger, younger Muslims. And what political Islam brought was a sort of commitment to egalitarianism, commitment to liberation, commitment to political activism for a lot of uh, American, uh, American Muslims who grew up in families that were involved in politics, who then took those into you know, women's rights movements, poverty movements. So there are lots of um, other groups like the, you know, not just the Muslim Student Association, but like, you know, uh, but the Muslim Student Association, for example, in UCLA, one of the ones that I know founded a free clinic in the 90s. Uh, to be able to, a lot of them were becoming doctors. They founded a free clinic to be able to do that. There's another organization, Iman, for example, that provides services in Chicago. Um, there are lots of the other, other types of the political activism that they have been, become involved in. And, um, and to get back to the Palestinian issue, those things are celebrated because they're helping America. They're you know, going into po impoverished neighborhoods and they're doing those. But that same type of thing could be done abroad. <laughs> uh, but that has been stymied. Yeah. One more? Yeah. And I'm just curious because you know, I'm, I'm fascinated with the transition from sort of Malcolm X to today. Mm -hmm. And I think white America was so scared of Malcolm X, right? I mean, just yeah, absolutely. scared of Malcolm X. Louis Farrakhan, his rantings just, again, heightened that fear. Mm -hmm. And then Islam is sort of underground, but it seems like white America, especially white middle class America, that's their impression of Islam. Because prior to this, you know, students in high schools, nobody even ever talked about Islam. And so you got that notion, and then it, that big gap almost to 9-11, to yeah. the Gulf Wars. And yeah. so there's this void of information that sort of white America is just, so they don't even know how to interpret Islam. And I don't mm -hmm. know if you think that's correct or... Well, yes, I think it is, and it's a lot more complicated too. So um, part of it is that, yes, you know, so when the, the hate that hate produced, this documentary that came out in 1959 on the Nation of Islam completely scared white America. Um, not because anything Nation of Islam did, actually, like China Islam forbade use of violence and unless, unless it was in defense and forbade people from carrying guns and things of that sort. Um, but a lot of it was like, look what we have done to these people. So if they actually could, <laughs> could come into society uh, freely, like, you know, how much anger they must, ha they must have, even though that anger is not really present in, the, in these communities themselves. Uh, but the other thing that they did is for African-American Christian organizations, it became a very nice stick to which they could say, like, look, white America, if you don't support us, look at these guys, which have fo further foster um, uh, anti-Muslim attitudes. Um, and it was actually African-American Christian New York communities. And a lot of the early folks that Sherman Jackson has talked about this, who wrote about the nation of Islam, wrote precisely to heighten these fears to be able to say, if you don't write, write the civil rights movement, um, you know, look what you face otherwise. And that Islam is a nefarious thing. And also, it was a means by which they could argue that African American, most African Americans are actually part of American culture. These people were asked, or separationists, or nationalists, it's because of Islam that they're that way. Um, of course, that ended up making it a lot more attractive to a lot of African Americans, <laughs> right? And, and to the point that I think, like, and Malcolm X's autobiography is a cla if there was a classic of American Islam, that's the classic text of American Islam that people read and white Americans are now reading and converting to Islam. And um, you know, so it made it a lot more, a lot more attractive. So yeah. Um, but there were, there were other phases too. There were other issues too, right? So that there were the hostage crisis, crisis like during the Olympic uh, in the 1970s. But that wasn't really talked about. If you look at newspaper accounts then, it was always talked about as Arab terrorism. It wasn't talked about in terms of Islam. It's not, it's not until after the Iranian Revolution that people began to talk about it as Islam. And even then, it was like a Shi'i thing. Um, you know, Sunnis weren't going to do this type of stuff. 
And this is why I think it's so important to allow American Muslims to talk about these experiences themselves because they could help clear the ways and some of, like, clear all the confusion about these things because the categories that we use for analysis are not right categories and not the right ways in which we ought to be thinking about these problems. I think, like again, as I mentioned, today's problem of radicalization um, is not about any type of ideologies in the media. Right? It's, in, it's that the certain media has become so important for getting heard. Uh, and the only way to get heard in that is through violence. <laughs> uh, that's fueling a lot of these things, not, not ideologies that most of these people don't know about. Um, you know, you could, I haven't talked to a person, but a friend of mine who, taught, who, who works on uh, uh, political, uh, political Islam, uh, micro organizations in the United States was talking about how he had heard FBI agents interviewing people who said that we knew much more about Islam than the people we were interviewing who belonged to these Islamist organizations. So it's not, you know, Islam is just part of these things. Yes? I was just wondering if you found American converts to Islam to be uh, religiously more conservative than <coughs> with whom uh, Islam is a long tradition in their family. There's no way I could generalize. It depends. I mean, there are people who aren't. There are people who are. Uh, depends on the reasons why they um, they converted. Um, yeah, it's a... It's a um, one of the things that I think I'm personally trying to push to do, and I think a lot of other of my colleagues are trying to do, is to say um, diversity is what we should expect. Unity is, as you, there's no, I mean, when you're studying religion, or when you think about religion, and particularly Islam, where there's no sort of central authority, uh, we should expect diversity. It just makes sense. It makes sense for people. People come from diverse experiences, they're going to understand their religion in different ways. Uh, we should stop trying to think of Islam as this homogenizing thing that makes everybody um, uh, the same.